good afternoon. I would like to welcome everybody to the Commodore for the second Tuesday Forum. Uh, my name is Sue Burton. I'm one of the co-chairs. Um, Mary Hodges is out handing out flyers. She's way over there. She's the other co-chair. And we do have several committee members here, and we would like to welcome you to this wonderful presentation. We are looking so forward to hearing from Dr. Lee and Ms. Newman about this project that they started, well, probably longer ago than they want to admit. But in the meantime, one of our committee members, uh, Ms. May Haywood, who most of you know is a former I.C. Norcom librarian and alumni, um, gatherer and historian and cemetery worker and community library advocate is going to come up and introduce our speaker. So thank you, May. Thank you so much, Sue. I don't know that I have all those hats, but I kind of think I do because I still got one on today. Um, I like to say that uh, it is a pleasure for me to do this today. Um, our presenters are Dr. Laurinette Lee and Paige Newman. I have to tell you that I first met Dr. Lee perhaps when she was working on her PhD because it was in 1996. And it was in Newport News at a very ambitious uh, meeting of the African American Histor Historical and Genealogical uh, Society. And I was just in awe at the research that she was doing, especially because I think she was working on her PhD at that time, right? And much of the information that she was collecting about, I think, the African American uh, community in Charlottesville seemed so, 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 so familiar with what I was doing of African Americans here in Portsmouth. So I developed a kinship to Dr. Lee at that time. But I don't want to uh, take too long, but I do want to tell you some of the facts that I know about Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee resides in Richmond, Virginia. She got her BA at Mundelein College in 1985, her MA in American History at Virginia State University in 93, her PhD from the University of Virginia in 2002. Her professional experience is that she is the founding curator of the African American History Department at the Virginia Historical Society. And at the time when I discovered the Virginia Historical Society, I don't think Dr. Lee was there, but I was just in awe at the information that I could find at that time. She has been the guest curator at the Legacy Museum in Lynchburg, Virginia. And I'm very fond of that particular museum. Haven't been there yet, but that's one of the models that I use, the Legacy Museum in Lynchburg and the Black History Museum in Alexandria. I expect to go to the Legacy this summer. I've already been to Alexandria. Um, Dr. Lee's professional experience continues with, um, she's archival transcriber, transcriber for the Digital History Project and entitled Unknown No Longer, which is what her pres presentation is about today. I had the opportunity to see that earlier at the Library of Virginia. You will see some wonderful information. Um, Dr. Lee has a lot of uh, teaching experience, which begins with perhaps the Chesterfield County Public Schools, Virginia Union University, Virginia Commonwealth University, and Old Dominion University. She has been a consultant for the Valentine Museum in Richmond. I've been there. Wonderful space for research. 
Um, she has been a consultant for the city of Hopewell, and that research was about African American oral history project, and she has a book from that particular study, Making Ameri the American Dream Work, African American History of Hopewell, Virginia. I must share the fact that Dr. Lee has been to Portsmouth several times, and the very last time that she was in Portsmouth was connecting with a grant that my organization, the African American Historical Society, had from the University of Virginia. And she presented that book to me. It is spectacular. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for that book. I love it. Moving on to some of uh, Dr. Lee's uh, experiences, she has had been commentator on television for uh, several uh, different times. Uh, one of them was uh, as commentator of Our Inspiration, the story of Maggie L. Walker in 1998 for public television. She's had numerous uh, affairs and presentations on radio, some of her additional publications include, of course, Making the American Dream Work, A Cultural History of African Americans in Hopewell, the same book. She has an entry in the wonderful work, The Dictionary of Virginia Biography. That's humongous. She has a book review in the Journal of Southern History, an essay for Footsteps Magazine, and a book review for the Virginia Magazine of History and Biography. Love that publication. Some of her awards and honors include a Fellowship of Oral History, Staff Fellowship Virginia Historical Society, the University of Virginia Conquering History Department Fellowship in 1999, Boston Public Library, the Alicia Monte Fellowship in 1998, Massachusetts Historical Society, the Mellon Fellowship in 1997, and the University of Virginia Graduate History Fellowship, 1996-97. Um, Dr. Lee has numerous community services. Her additional professional uh, affiliations include a member of the Oral History Association and the Southern Historical Association. The second presenter today is, and I just met her today, but we have a kinship because she is a lab, former librarian. She's Paige Newman. She joined the Virginia Historical Society in 2003 and is currently an assistant archivist. She received her undergraduate degree in classics slash history from Emory and Henry College in 2004. She earned her MS Library of Science degree from the Catholic University of America. Paige is active with the Friends of the Richmond Public Library. I present to you today our presenters, Dr. Laurette Lee and Paige Newman. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out. This is our first time here at the Commodore, and it is absolutely beautiful. You all are so fortunate to have this facility here. When Paige and I came into the lobby, we were just swept away. And then when we came around the corner, we were like, whoa. <laughs> and we're speaking here. This is beautiful. Thanks to all that have contributed to making this happen and to all that you're doing to preserve the history here in Portsmouth. One of the things that we are very proud to do is to preserve history at the Virginia Historical Society. Paige and I have been working on this project since 2010, but actually it was a colleague of Paige's that first brought this idea to the fore. Do you want to mention Eileen? Sure, yes. Um, my colleague Eileen Parrish, she's an archivist at the Virginia Historical Society, and she 
no, knew and knows that Virginia's historical society need to beef up our African American genealogy resources. So she was just molding things in her head and thinking we need to figure out how we can get African American um, genealogy information out and how do we get enslaved names, you know, accessible to the public. So she came up with this idea and through working with our uh, vice president of collections, Lee Shepard, they molded it over and here we are now through generous support from Dominion Foundation. We are really fortunate in that um, Virginia Historical Society has a multitude of records. The society was formed in 1831. It was the same year that Nat Turner rebelled against slavery in Southampton County. And it's also the same year that our organization was founded by um, James Monroe. George Marshall, I'm sorry. I sometimes I get <laughs> Thank you. And because of the um, membership, most of the families, if not all of them, were elite Virginia families. And so it is their records that we're able to extract the names of enslaved people who were considered property at that time. And so we're looking through inventories, account books. Um, we have been very fortunate to have at least 37 different categories that help us to extract those names. Um, we first began compiling that information of the enslaved people in the 90s. And then in 2002, we were able to get a grant to create this guide to African American uh, manuscripts. And we have some here if you would like um, one, and they are free. Um, one of the things with printed material, though, is once it's published, it's out of date. And so we do have an online catalog that's constantly updated. Uh, that you could go to, and that is also the African American Guide to Manuscripts. And what the guides do is give you uh, a picture of a forest of trees. What this database does is give you images of the leaves on the trees. And so we are able to help uh, give dignity to identity, to provide some flesh on the bones of Southern history and that onus institution slavery. We really are very interested in looking at American history. And this database provides information not only about the enslaved people, but about the slave owners as well. And it is through the slave owners documents that we're able to find this information about the enslaved people. And so as we think about um, what this database can do. There's a stanza that comes to my mind from a song written by James Weldon Johnson. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. And you will see as we go through this, um, and give you an overview of the site that we are able to lift all of the voices of American and Virginia history so that we can learn more about our past. Okay, how many of you all have actually visited the site itself? Yeah, or even the Virginia Historical Society site. I'm sure you go daily, look at it all the time. <laughs> We do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you go to our site, and what we're going to do is I'm going to just give you a quick overview of how the site works, what's in it, and then Laurenette will do a couple searches to give you an idea what you'll find when you do a search. You go to our home page, it'll pop up, and that's www.vahistorical.org, and click on Unknown No Longer, and it'll take you to our main page. When we started designing the database in March of 2010, yeah, it's 2013, 20, yeah, it seems like it hasn't been that long ago. We wanted to look at the site as something that once you saw it, you could get right into it and easily understand how to use it. So just give you a quick overview. Um, when we look at the manuscripts to pull out enslaved people's names, we're looking for first names and surnames of slaves 
Typically, um, enslaved people did not take the owner's last name. A lot of people assume they did, but they did not. We also have the option to go by gender. Again, um, some names doesn't specify gen gender, and we don't always know. Also, um, in various manuscripts, you'll see that it's just a child, and we don't know the gender. But we do know that the mother had two children when they were sold, and it gives a value for both, or all three. Occupation is another way to search. And these are pulled out from the manuscripts themselves. This is not a pre-populated field. We have advanced search options. Go by date range. Go by state, because slavery did extend beyond Virginia. And then we have city and county. And this is not pre-populated either. These are cities and counties that are taken from our manuscripts. Ideally, we want to get all the cities and counties, and included West Virginia, too, before 1861. And then location name is plantation name. Also, search field has the owner's last name, and then record type, which is, um, Lauren mentioned earlier, is pre-populated. We have about 37 different types of records where we are extracting the enslaved people's names and the owner's names. We scroll down, you can see more information about the project and the lovely Lornette in the video, and then um, info about Dominion. If you don't feel like getting in there and typing names, you can browse by record type. And the different types of records will pop up. Scroll down. And from here, you can actually click in to a type of record. And the search results will pop up. And once you click into one of those, you'll get a more of a record detail. And this will list all the information we have about the enslaved person and the owner. If there's any notes about the slave, it'll be un under the name. This is the owner's name, so it has how many slaves the owner owns. Um, record type. The record call number is important because this is the record call number that we use at the Historical Society that you can use when you come to the Society to actually look at the document in our library. And we are open Monday through Saturday, 10 to 5, and we are free, and we want you all to come visit. The record title will list any information about the record. And the document notes are notes that we've pulled out of the record. Say if you don't really want to get in there and read 18th, 19th century writing or have some difficulty with it. And you can get click in the letter and look at magnifies. And you can go to, hopefully you can see everything I'm doing, go to full size so you can actually read the document itself. So you see why Paige and I are wearing glasses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do on a regular basis. Basically, when we survey the manuscripts, this is exactly what we do. And once the manuscript is surveyed, we have it digitized. We pull it on the, back up on the database and input the information into the database and then push it out to the public so you can view it. Another tab is Browse by Location. And here we're using Google Maps as a search. And here's some of Virginia. You can pull back and see what we've done. If we go, you can just click on unnamed location means that it does not have a plantation attributed to it. You should be able to click in there and whatever's around that area, the documents will pop up. Another tab is related resources. This are, these are other online projects that we looked at when designing the database, but also other online projects that are useful for genealogical research. <laughs> um, the question is, is there any way to search through historically um, African American communities? Not in this database, not on the no long, excuse me, unknown no longer itself, but I think in some of these um, online projects, Links, I believe there is. And Lorinette might have more info. Yes, there is a database here that will help you get to local um, projects. Um, African American. Oh, that's up. We'll find it before we leave here. It's in our head. We look at this so much. 
we oftentimes <laughs> forget what it is that we see. That's it. Yeah. Now, the site that Lornet's pulling up, it has a lot of links that, it, yeah. And you see it's listed by county already. Okay. I've seen Accomack, Alexandria, Chesterfield, Dinwiddie, Fairfax. So it'll list all of the counties where there is a database already. Or where items have been digitized, either through the city or county itself. And here you can see Fairfax wills and estates of one person. Someone's taken the effort to digitize and that. So Let's see if there's a portrait. Oh, yeah. Let me okay. go down. We're going to look for Portsman. So I don't know how, do all of you do genealogy work? No. Yes, no, yeah. Because I know, well, if you do, you know how time consuming it is. So this is a good side if you have a couple days of doing nothing but geological work. Yeah, and yeah. there is no Portsman. Uh, Norfolk, Norfolk County, okay. Okay. Good. And and this is listed oddly alphabetical, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. I don't see nothing. But you said you saw it. Yeah, I think there is. It might be further under. Mm -hmm. But take a little time, look at the related resources, and then the African American Gateway is an amazing resource for lots of links, obviously, that you've seen the list to other African American information. Another tab is about this project, and this just gives you more background about that. And then the message board is a way to communicate with us. You're also welcome to contact us, email, or give us a call if you do have more questions, because I know we can't answer that many in our amount of time. But the message board gives people, you see discussions and throwing up information that you either have about your family, questions about your family, because this message board, other researchers, genealogists, and interested people take a look at, and you never know who's going to have information. So that's a quick overview. How about if you want to do? Yes. Let me mention yes. with the message board, you do need to register in order to uh, post a comment. And it's an easy registration process. One of the things we wanted to do is to appeal to a wide audience. And so um, the experienced genealogist as well as a, a new family historian, students, teachers, um, someone who's looking for basic information about 19th century Virginia history would be able to use this site and use it easily. So let's look at uh, some examples from the different localities. For example, Norfolk. We're looking at a list. There we go. And this is um, an 1857 list of enslaved people owned by Sarah Camp Shepherd of Norfolk, Virginia. Slowly. There's a delay, but there, we go. there you go. You can see all of the enslaved people that she owned would have been classified as a, a slave community. And this is what John Blassengame wrote about in the 70s when many historians began to look at African American history. And so these people comprise a community on the plantation owned by Sarah Camp in Norfolk. We're giving you um, a close-up detail of the digitized copy. They would be um, groups of people who form into families. Um, with slavery, one of the um, <clears throat> onious aspects of slavery is that oftentimes families are sold are split apart. Um, usually males are sold uh, more frequently than females, and they're sold at younger ages. Um, and so the slave owner would most often mention 
mothers and children. They don't mention fathers because fathers are moved around. And part of the institution of, of slavery means breaking down those basic units, which is one is family. In addition to um, providing the names and family relationships, and it's usually the mother and child, um, slave owners provided uh, values, the prices that they either bought or sold enslaved people at for. And if we were to go into um, any of these names, what you'll find is we pull out any information that's in the document about that name. So you can see here Clementine was hired to Mrs. Leaker for $65.1856 in the first and second. Um, in 1858, she was hired to Stanley for $75, and she was valued at $75 in 1859, hired to Stevens for $70 in 1862. So you can see the fluctuations within the market by looking at information like this. And you'll see that record call number. If you want it to come into the library to look at that original, that's the number that you would write on a call slip, and that document would be pulled for you. We've also provided the map down below that gives you an approximation of where this um, plantation is located. And we also digitize each page um, where names are associated. Yes. Um, so, genealogically speaking, if someone wanted to track their family back to this community here, they, the researcher would then would have to find out that the person somehow would have to link that person to the to the plantation. Yes. If so, if not the plantation, the area. Yes. Then maybe the plantation. And then once they got to the names, I guess it would they'd have to have at least a first name. They, I mean, and that would be the furthest they could get, especially since you said they did not usually take the last name of the owner. Right? Yes. Yes. So starting with that big picture, if you know the area where family ancestors were zero in on the plantation owner. Um, and if there are records associated with that plantation owner, many of the private papers are at the Virginia Historical Society. Um, the public papers are at the Library of Virginia, though they also have public, private papers as well. So how often do people have the ability to go back to the research to identify plantation owner? Um, but then, I mean, I've been doing some genealogy, and then of course the problem is that the first name tends to be very common. So it's very difficult unless you have. Oh, you have to be retired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Because <laughs> it is very time consuming. And I cannot, I, I know that there are people who work full time and do this, but that's all they do. They don't. That is their extracurricular. How would you find, well, I guess if you have a community, that they, at that point in time, the plantations might be large, and so there might only be, in that particular geographic area, a certain number of owners, plantation mm -hmm. owners. And then you would search out of the plantation on the record yes. to see if you see any names that are similar to their family names, although you might see duplications. Yes. Yes. Dr. B, when you say hired out, is that person, the, the enslaved person working for the plantation owner or the owner? Uh, okay. May just asked a question about being hired out. If you were an enslaved person and you were hired out, your slave owner hires you out. For example, um, we have records of a slave that was hired out by his owner to Tredegar. Ironworks in Richmond, and there he had a bond. Um, yeah. 
So could you tell me what that would look like if you're hired out and you are in a different sense, what would that look like in terms of the time? For that explain? Yes. And usually you're hired out for a year, okay, and you would work at that place where you were hired. In this case, it's Tredegar Ironworks. And we also know that um, slave owners took out uh, um, life insurance policies on their slaves, particularly when they worked in the factories, um, because the factories were so dangerous. If the slave lost a limb or a life, the slave owner would be compensated. And did all the money go to the the owner? Uh, did any amount go to the place? No, the money went to the owner, particularly when they're hired out to um, factories like uh, Tredegar. Now, there are instances where slave owners would let a slave keep a portion of the money. Um, and in that way, slaves were able to buy their freedom or the freedom of family members. Yes. I was just wondering, in doing research now, if you can go back, let's say that a lot of people can go back and find their great grandmother, say in the, in the 1900 census or something like that. So if you have her name, she may have been born a slave. Yes. So that helps. Or you may, so you may have, you may have you may, somebody living together, you may assume it's her mother. So that's, is that how like, most people get into, go into this and then they have that name? But the comment was about finding ancestors slaves. through census records? Yes, I'm telling you, they would, probably if they were born, born a slave, then you have something to go on when you go back to the... Yes, to the, and you could use the census records beginning in 1870. Yeah, right. And that those census would give you information about the former slave owner, um, mother, father's name, if they know it, and uh, the location where they live. So here we're looking at a bond. Um, Joe, who was hired by J.M. Burton for the Tredegar Iron Works, and this was in 1864, during the war. Okay, so we see a lot of movement during the war of African Americans, not only in the work um, environment, but also because they would move about at um, when there was a Union Army nearby. For example, we look at Westover. And Westover is the name of a plantation just outside of Richmond. And this document um, tells us a lot about the movement of African Americans during the war. This was in 1862, about August. This um, document was created by the owner who said, list of Negroes that left Westover with the Yankees in August last. And it was, this was just before um, President Lincoln issued the preliminary uh, Emancipation Proclamation in September of 62. So you see all of the names of, of the people who were on the plantation but left when the Yankee um, army, Yankee. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and I'm from Virginia. <laughs> when the Union <laughs> Army was near, they had been pushed out of Richmond, and they were in the Charles City area. And so um, these enslaved people, knowing that, went to the Union Army uh, for sanctuary. We do know that within this group, there were five mothers with children. Um, there were two people who died, one died the day after the Union Army left, and the slave master said she died of fright. Another man uh, died working on fortifications. Um, and so once you get into the document, you find a great deal of information that can help you piece together a part of uh, Virginia and Civil War history from a different perspective. So you're looking at the battle from another side. You're looking at it from the side of the African Americans um, who went to the Union Army for sanctuary. You'll see the ages listed there. Prices. Could you talk a little about that? Because I never thought about women and children going to the Union Army for sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
the question was, how does it work when um, women and children went to the Union Army for help? Um, when the Union Army is near, um, whole families are leaving the plantation. So we're seeing an out-migration, an exodus from the plantation economy. The work is going to stop because you have whole groups of people leaving. Um, and they're leaving with young, elderly um, mothers and fathers. Well, initially, the Union Army didn't know what to do with, with women and children. They call this species of property. Um, General Benjamin Butler uh, was in Fort Monroe at the time when people started coming to the Union uh, Fort there. Um, and so quickly they started turning the women and children away because they didn't know what to do with them. The men they would let stay and work. And by the time that men were able, um, were allowed to fight in the war, um, they had started making a way for women and children. So in the um, Fort Monroe area, Hampton, you start having huge numbers of people leaving plantations and coming to start what they call shanty towns, slab town, dog town, all of those outlying areas because there were too many people to fit into Fort Monroe. And that's when you start having um, communities forming in in and after the Civil War. Yes, sir. It, it's worth noting that uh, Union policy about <coughs> uh, escaped slaves uh, changed radically during the first two years of the war. Uh, as you said, at first, uh, women and children were turned away. By the summer of 1862, Congress had passed the Second Confiscation Act, which forbade Union uh, soldiers from turning away any slaves who came into the lines. So Thank you. You, you saw a shift, uh, a radicalization very rapidly, even before the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And most people tend to think that um, enslaved people did not really do anything until the Emancipation Proclamation or until the war was over. But actually, we're seeing them taking a great deal of agency even prior to the Emancipation Proclamation. Any other questions? How much time? I about we have? five more minutes. Five more minutes. Yes. Do these records cover the entire state of Virginia? Do the records cover the entire state of Virginia? They do. Um, because um, they're coming to us from families all over the Commonwealth. Um, and we have a cornucopia of records. We have about eight and a half million collections. Um, we, when we launched the database in September of 2011, we started with 1,500 names. Um, this past September, we reached 10,000 names. So it's, it's a, a big jump, but it, we have a long way to go. Yes, sir. Have you also, I have, <laughs> have you also included those crossover areas um, Hampton at one point, part of Hampton is part of North Carolina. Yes. Have we, the question was, have we included crossover areas? We've gone beyond the borders of Virginia. Um, let me show the map. Oh, that one. Um, because slaveholders were moving their slaves further south and out west, um, we look at um, if the, the record originates in Virginia and the slave owner makes a record of those slaves he took with him, we are able to capture that. And we do know if, you know, if when looking at the date, we will include if it's now, or it was West Virginia, now West Virginia, it was North Carolina, now Virginia. We'll, we'll note that in the notes field, or we'll have brackets around the city or state. And here, just to give you an idea that there's some, we're, we're moving out of the border of Virginia. Okay. A question over here? Yeah, I'll just put my record in North Carolina because that's where my parents both come from. The question was, are there equivalent records for North Carolina? There is a database that deals with uh, petitions, um, slave records and petitions. 
um, out of, I believe it's Duke, but we've listed that under related resources for you to take a look at. And there are similar, I mean, records. Each state will have these types of records. It's just a matter of we've started doing this database. There are other databases similar to this for maybe um, more narrow field like uh, counties or more pockets of a population. But we're kind of maybe the first ones to start really extracting names out of our own collection and putting it in this type of form. Yeah, uh, two questions. Uh, I'm interested in uh, colonization uh, to Liberia. So how to track, uh, but I don't have any names. So how do I start in terms of uh, following, uh, following that trail? And the second question is about Dred Scott in terms of we know that he was in Southampton County and to figure out uh, where he went where he was before and where he went after. Okay, the first question was about uh, organizations, Liberia, um, which was formed in the uh, early 19th century. Mm -hmm. There are colonization chapters and organizations, many of them um, headed by women, um, because they were very involved in um, educating blacks because they believed that those blacks who were educated would be the best leaders for Liberia and the capital Monrovia. Um, and so colonization, the American Colonization Society is the larger national organization and then there were state and local organizations as well. And so the, the heading would be the American Colonization Society. And then Dred Scott. Um, I'm not familiar with his movements in Southampton County. Nat Turner was, was the, is the name most associated with um, Southampton County. Definitely. <laughs> but the Southampton <laughs> Historical Society was sure that we talk about Dred Scott more. Um, okay. I, I think um, Quarstein is to, I cannot think if it's John Corstein, I think is doing some research on Southampton County. Any other questions, comments? This is a free database. We're very fortunate to have received funding from Dominion to help us launch and promote it. Um, and it's a database that's continually growing. So we ask that you check back every week. If you check and you, um, put in a name and no results found comes back, um, that means that that particular name has not been entered into the database thus far. It doesn't mean that it won't be. It's just, it takes a lot of times. So we have a, a meticulous checks and balances system before we put anything out on the web to make sure it's as accurate as possible. Um, the other... Um, on the eve of the Civil War, 1860, there were 500,000. Virginia was the largest slave holding state. And so that's one reason why um, we have so many records uh, about uh, slavery, because the slaveholders wanted to keep track of their property. Yes. Are, have you found since you've published this database that, that more people are contributing family documents um, so that you can expand your records? Yes. Um, we have been very fortunate uh, to have people who have gone through their attics and basements and in closets knowing that they've had documents and not know what to do with them. We are here for you. <laughs> <laughs> And Paige works in the collections uh, department. Um, and when records come in, she's the one that actually goes through and do what archivists do. <laughs> <laughs> Just read other people's mail. Yeah. Right. Do you have a question? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> If you do have papers in your attic in your basements, remove them from those two areas and put them in the house in a closet. <laughs> Just FYI. But yeah, um, feel free to contact us, um, either myself or my uh, boss, Lee Shepard. He's the vice president of collections. 
And you don't, not saying you have to give them to us, but if you do have questions, concerns about your papers, and they don't even have to be slave records, just let us know. Do you have many things that are pre-revolutionary war? The question was, do we have things about before, pre, before the Revolutionary War, and we do. The yeah. earliest document we have in the database is 1698, think, yeah. but we have records even earlier than that in the Historical Society. Yeah, let's, we're almost done with our time, let's see. So we go, I think it's 1698. I think it is too. See how this search does. Yeah. Wow. This is from Stafford County in 1698. And so, Will, two slaves. Could I share my experience at the Virginia Historical Society? When I was looking for Jeffrey Wilson, when I was looking for Jeffrey Wilson's owner, it was at the Virginia Historical Society that I was at the Little Mice Cart Catalog. And I found a record that a sister of Dr. Grice, who was the slave owner of Jeffrey Wilson, there, and it was like a gold mine. So those records do exactly what you say because she told about the personal experiences with uh, George W. Grice. Not Jerry Wilson, but it was from the owner's perspective of what was going on in the family. So the records really speak to what you're saying. Definitely. Thank you so much for mentioning that because we do encourage people to come in. Um, we are open from 10 to 5, Monday through Saturday. And the museum is also open on Sunday, 1 to 5, and we're free all of those days. So come on by. Oh. 428 North Boulevard on the corner of Kensington and Boulevard in Richmond. Um, we're on the opposite end of the corner from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Yes, sir. You we don't have flyers. Um, because our w website is really our flyer, and that is on our homepage, www.vahistorical.org. We do have some guides. And even though after you publish something, it becomes outdated, it's something that we still use. We use this on a daily basis. This is what we go to determine what records we're going to pull next to look at. And you can see from my sticky notes that it's well used. Well, let me close by um, finishing with a stanza from Lift Every Voice and Sing, Stony the Road We Trod, Bitter the Chastening Rod Felt in the Days When Hope Unborn Had Died, Yet with a Steady Beat Have Not Our Weary Feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. Thank you so much for coming here today. All right, thank you so much to Dr. Lee and um, also to Paige. And um, if anybody has not received a survey, uh, if you could please raise your hand, someone will come around and give you a survey. Um, those of you who have received them, we would appreciate if you would fill those out for us. Uh, that provides valuable feedback for us in planning uh, next year's lecture series. And we do have one more lecture in this season. Um, that will be March 12th. Uh, Mark Robbins is the archivist for the Norfolk Shipyard, and he will be coming to talk about the Civil War in Portsmouth. Um, that's on your flyer if you received one. Also, if you did not receive a flyer, I'd be happy to come around and pass one out to you. And um, we do have a few minutes left if anybody would like to come up and speak to our speakers. <laughs> and uh, thank you again so much for coming. Thank you. Happy 20th. Yeah, happy 20th.